We'll go ahead and jump in then. Uh, thanks everybody for taking the time to intro yourselves. Um, so again, this Ignite Lab was something that we created in an effort to try and make it easier for folks to get some experience, hands-on experience with some of these uh, cloud native techniques. Um, let's see uh, where we are today. So we got to meet some folks. I would encourage you to follow along. Uh, so you can just uh, pull up this URL in your browser. It should be in the Slack channel, k8-ignite.com. Just go and pull that up. All the material, all the labs, everything from today is available there. I'm going to just be walking through that. So I'd encourage you to walk along, walk through that with me as I go. Um, we already talked about uh, the icebreaker. Got a chance to meet everybody. Uh, so let's talk about uh, let's talk about cloud native. So we we like the definition of cloud native that the CNCF provides. CNCF Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Uh, so this, this is a quote right here, straight off of their website, links right there. Uh, so rather than try to define it myself, I'm going to use this definition here. Uh, so let's talk about this real quick, because I think it's important to understand what cloud native is before we then talk about why it helps with delivering, uh, improving our uh, speed and safety of delivery. So uh, let me just read through this real quick, make sure we're on the same page. Cloud native technologies empower organizations to build and run scalable applications in modern dynamic environments such as public, private, and hybrid clouds. So the first thing to note there is uh, that cloud native doesn't necessarily imply public cloud, which also means the, the converse is true. Just because you're running in AWS does not mean you're doing cloud native architecture and delivery. Uh, so so that's, that's the first thing we need to make sure we're aligned on. So then what is cloud native? Uh, well, they, they give some examples. These don't necessarily, this isn't a list of checkboxes that you must check in order to be cloud native. These are just some examples. Containers, service meshes, microservices, immutable infrastructure, and declarative APIs. I'll exemplify this approach. So if you're looking for, okay, well, cloud native is not just running in AWS, then what are some examples of what cloud native looks like? These are some examples. Uh, okay, so now we get to the important stuff. What is, what is the desired outcome of, of using these cloud native techniques? These techniques enable loosely coupled systems, right? We all want loosely coupled. For those who have been doing this long enough, you know, we've been talking about loosely coupled, at least for my entire career. Uh, we want loosely coupled systems that are resilient, manageable, and observable. Combined with robust automation, they allow engineers to make high impact changes frequently and predictably with minimal toil. And that's really the punchline, that last bit. High impact changes frequently, highlight circle frequently and predictably. So goes back to Lietro's mission, we're all about helping people deliver software with more speed and safety. This is why we latch onto this, is because cloud native approaches are intended to build loosely coupled systems that help you deliver software faster and help you deliver software safer. So that's why we're looking at this stuff. So now, now what are we gonna talk about today? Well, there's five core components of cloud native architectures that we're going to spend our, our time on today. That's going to result in five different modules uh, of our lab today. And each of those will have hands on labs that you'll be doing to get experience in those different areas. Uh, the first is containers. Uh, containers specifically, we're talking about uh, Docker containers. So we're going to be looking at what, how do we use containers to, to uh, encapsulate the complexity of an application. We're gonna talk about continuous delivery, how you can use uh, techniques around small batch to actually decrease risk involved with software delivery. We're gonna talk about microservices and how decoupling the application can actually allow teams to work independently and thereby working uh, with more speed. Uh, we're gonna talk about approaches to doing deployments with safety. We'll look at things like blue-green deployments, canary deployments, A-B testing. And then last, we're going to talk about observability. Uh, and that is, okay, you've got this new environment. You've got this new approach to running these applications. How do you actually manage the application and support the application? Uh, and that gets into uh, observability. So that's the high level of what we're going to cover today. We've got a lot to cover. We're going to be moving pretty quick. I would ask, uh, feel free, if something's not making sense, flip your camera on, put your hand up. I'm happy to pause. Would love to uh, go deep on specific things. So don't be shy. Want to know that everybody's out there. Uh, I've got, I've got everybody over here. So if you keep seeing me look to the left, it's because I'm looking for faces of uh, people.
people nodding, getting excited, or people looking confused so we can go deeper on. So if there's something you want to go deep on, uh, make, make yourself known on Zoom and I'll see you. Okay, so what, do, what, what should you expect about today? What, what is our, what's the roadmap with how we're going to, to play these things out? Well, we're going to start with a, a monolithic application. And I'll introduce it to you in just a minute. But we're going to take this monolithic app and throughout our journey today, we're going to containerize it, get it running inside Docker containers on Kubernetes. Then we're going to build a continuous delivery pipeline for that uh, monolithic application. Uh, and we will orchestrate the creation and execution of that pipeline through chat ops, through Slack. Y'all are in Slack. I, if you're not, you need to get in there as soon as possible. Uh, and then last, we're going to decompose the monolith. Once we get the monolith running, we're then going to start uh, extracting microservice from that monolith. Uh, I, I want to focus on Dilbert real quick because uh, it's always a good place to start. Uh, so just take a moment and uh, let's read this. I need to know why, the point here boss says, I need to know why moving our app to the cloud didn't automatically solve all our problems. Dilbert says, well, you didn't let me architect to be cloud native. And so then uh, boss just says, well, fine, put in containers. And Dilbert, you can't solve a problem just by saying techie things. Of course, the response to everything is Kubernetes, right? Uh, I say all this because uh, kind of poking fun at this lab itself in that we're going deep in a lot of these cutting edge things. I want to make sure that as a part of this lab and a part of this experience, everything that we highlight and show, first of all, everything that we show is, is we're going to show a lot of open source projects, a lot of uh, best of breed CNCF projects. Um, and so most of this is not something that is a, a, a vendor uh, provided software. These are all things that you can implement inside your organization. But I want to make sure that everything we demonstrate and all the techniques we talk about ultimately tie back to how do we deliver software faster and safer? So this isn't just about talking about cool tech because the tech is cool. All of this should ultimately result in the ability to deliver faster and safer. And if it doesn't connect for you, raise your hand. Let's talk about it. Cool. All right. So let me introduce the monolith. Uh, We're going to be using this monolithic application that uh, Pivotal actually created uh, over eight years ago. The name of the application is uh, the Spring Trader app. This was developed um, eight plus years ago as a way to demonstrate some open source projects and, and proprietary products that uh, Spring slash Pivotal slash VMware had been building. So it really highlights the way applications were built back in those days. Spring MVC is a big part of it. Uh, and then there's a whole bunch of legacy proprietary uh, pain that we have with this application. Why did we do this? We did not want to just create a simple hello world app for this, this lab. I've been to too many of these types of labs where somebody shows a small little hello world app written in Node.js and it's like, yay, here's how to run a hello world app on Kubernetes. That, that doesn't help anybody, especially not our clients in the enterprise. So we wanted to give you something that was kind of hard. This runs on the JVM. This takes a while to compile. It has a ton of Gradle dependencies. It's, it's, it's monolithic in nature. We'll look at that in a minute. So there's challenges here because we wanted a more real world situation. Uh, so what does this app look like? Well, there's five core components to the application from a logical perspective. Uh, starting from the top, there's a presentation tier, which is mostly HTML, CSS, JavaScript. That, that layer is making REST calls to the application. And then the application has a series of these uh, REST APIs that are all bundled up into a single deployable artifact, this uh, section B here. It's all running as a single uh, jar, uh, a, a, a single um, web application uh, that, that serves all of those different endpoints. There's a message broker, RabbitMQ is deployed inside this architecture, but the other side of RabbitMQ, the integration services, is, is actually deployed together with the app services. So B and D is all running in a single process in a single JVM. And so the, the, the app services is dropping messages into Rabbit and then it's also consuming them. So it's, it's a pretty tightly coupled environment there. And then last, you've got this data tier, which uh, we'll look at in a minute, is a proprietary uh, data store from, mm -hmm. from uh, VMware. So if we look at what the physical infrastructure looks like here, this is the recommended approach for deploying this application uh, as of eight plus years ago. So you put a load balancer 
at, at the top, like a F5 if you're running this on-prem. And then uh, you, you run some VMs. On those VMs, you're running a, uh, a piece of middleware called vFabric TC server. That's basically VMware's proprietary version of Tomcat. So we've got the equivalent of a Tomcat server here, but it's VMware's Tomcat. You got RabbitMQ also running on that VM to, uh, to do some uh, integration services with some of the other capabilities running inside that VM. And then you've got another VM uh, running with Pivotal SQL Fire. SQL Fire is this proprietary distributed database that uh, VMware created. Uh, it's end of life. You can't get it anymore. You can't get support for it, uh, which makes this an even more interesting challenge. How are we going to get all of that stuff running in a cloud native environment, right? This is, again, not a hello world application. Okay, so what are the challenges with this, this uh, approach? So the challenges with the application come down to two things. One is the coupling involved with teams. And so this is what a, uh, a process flow might look like to make a change to the application. You got a lot of people involved. Developers are opening tickets with DBAs to make deployments and changes to the SQL Fire database. You got developers making tickets to the middleware teams. Developers are making tickets with the networking team to provision the, the load balancer and with operations team to provision the VMs necessary to, uh, to run the application. A lot of moving parts here, a lot of coordination. Uh, I would expect you all have seen very similar environments to this at your own organizations. This, this can be painful and very error prone. The other challenge is that uh, the teams themselves are coupled together. So you might have this one monolithic application with three different capabilities in it, represented by these three different colored boxes. And there might be three different teams that manage those different capabilities. But all of those teams are forced to deliver at the cadence of the lowest common denominator. So if you've got one team that wants to deliver daily, well, they can't deliver daily because there's another team that's only set up to deliver monthly, maybe the way their testing and release cycles work. And so therefore the entire monolithic app can only release monthly. And you've got teams that even though their capabilities might, the be, their business partners could benefit from delivering faster, they're, they're constrained and cannot. Uh, you also have this pain of deployment coupling where because all of these components are running in a single uh, process instead of inside a single JVM. If you run into a situation where one of those components starts to consume more memory than uh, it's, it should be, or maybe it's consuming more CPU, it's consuming all the CPU on the, on the VM, all of the other components are then impacted as a result. And so you could have this situation where you bring down an entire application just because one component is misbehaving. So what are we going to do? So today, our mission is to take this application and use cloud native techniques to address those concerns about team coupling and deployment coupling. We're going to containerize this application, we're going to build pipelines for it, and then we're going to start to decompose it into microservices. And so this picture really represents what our end state is going to look like. Now, if there's some terms on here that you're not familiar with, don't worry. Uh, we'll go deep on those in a little bit. I just wanted to give you an intro, an overview of how this is going to look. So we're going to, first of all, the A represented the uh, F5 layer. We're, we're getting rid of that. Uh, we're going to be using um, Istio uh, for getting traffic into our uh, application and then routing the traffic to the application. We're going to be using uh, a handful of Kubernetes resources. We're going to use deployments that uh, then have pods. Yep. We're going to have a pod that represents the equivalent of what our VMs were previously. So we'll have a pod that runs TC server and RabbitMQ, two containers in a single pod, and manage that pod deployment uh, through deployment resources. Uh, we'll eventually end up creating another deployment with a different pod running a Spring Boot microservice that contains uh, one API from the original application. We're going to use stateful sets to manage pods for our database for the Pivotal SQL Fire and persistent volumes to uh, manage the, the durability of the data in that database. 
And then last thing we're going to do is use Kubernetes jobs to run some Groovy scripts that were originally provided with this application to configure the database. So this might be a good place to pause and just see if there's any questions on the current monolithic application and what our approach is for it. Any questions? Can't see any faces. I don't know if people are excited or confused. All right, I'll assume silence is golden. Okay, so I said there was uh, three main things that we're gonna be doing as part of this transformation. We're gonna be containerizing it. Uh, containers, from the, from the introductions I heard from everybody, uh, most folks are doing something with Kubernetes or have some comfort level with Kubernetes uh, containers. Not gonna go too deep on this, but uh, just basic introduction. You probably all have seen this picture before on uh, Docker's website. This was how containers were originally introduced. The idea being rather than using traditional virtualization where you virtualize the hardware to the operating system, with containers, we're virtualizing the operating system to the process. And uh, so we're, we're, we're going to be using containers as a mechanism to take all of that complexity that was there either in the, uh, the middleware layer with the, the VMware TC server or with the uh, data layer with the SQL Fire server, and we're going to uh, put that complexity inside of containers. On the continuous delivery side, uh, the, the, the approach here is to uh, provide short feedback cycles and to provide fast feedback uh, on changes that are made and then also decrease risk by actually uh, limiting how much change goes in at a given time. So you've got this idea of a delivery pipeline. Every organization has this. It might be manual, it might be automated, it might be a combination of both. It's different for every organization. But what's interesting about this picture is you got developers on the left, you got customers on the right, and you got some business partners that ultimately manage the customers and provide the requirements to the developers, right? No surprises there. Uh, here's, here's where it gets interesting. Biz, your business partners, they don't care about how fancy your delivery pipeline is. Like the tools that you have for build, test, release, they don't really care that you're using the latest and greatest tooling and, and how that looks. They really don't. What they care about is how quickly can you get changes from the left to the right? How quickly can you get those features into the hands of the customers? That's really all they care about. They don't want to hear about the cool tools. So our job is to enable them to provide the features that the customers need by building a pipeline that supports that need. But there's one other thing. They don't just care about how fast you can make changes from left to right. They don't, that's measured in lead time. They don't just care about the lead time. They also care about another uh, metric, which is deployment frequency. And that's how often are they getting that feedback from the right to the left? Just because you can deliver to production in 10 minutes, but if you could only actually do that once every month, uh, that's also not meeting the need. We need to be able to deliver the, the make, make new uh, features, features available to customers free, uh, quickly, but also make them often. We want to be able to give our business partners uh, feedback on the changes that are being made uh, in the, uh, to, for the customers. And then the last thing we want to accomplish is we want to go towards a microservice architecture. So the challenge here is we've got, we talked about a couple things that were painful with um, team coupling and with deployment coupling. So microservices provide, they have, there's four core principles of microservices and we'll see how these address these concerns. So the first uh, principle that you see with microservices is, is the idea of team autonomy. Each team should be able to own not just the, the building of their application, but also when they deploy and what, how, when they want to make architectural changes to the software. For example, let's say one team decides they want to move um, to a, a Spring Boot type deployment. Currently, they would have to coordinate with all the other teams, get agreement on making the changes. Everybody would have to regression test that change to the version of Spring across everybody, right? You've got this tight coupling between all the teams. With microservices, each team ought to be able to make that choice independent of each other and execute it independent of each other. 
So team autonomy is a core principle of microservices that we ought to accomplish through this exercise. The second is independent deployments. Uh, and, and really what we're looking for here is to break apart the, the, the dependencies between applications on deployments. We want teams to be able to uh, run their application in different process space and be able to scale them independent of each other. This way, if you have that situation where one component uh, starts to consume excessive CPU or memory, you're able to scale it out independent of the others, or you're able to allow it to fail gracefully without bringing down the rest of the application. Two other core principles that are critical to uh, designing microservices is the idea of public APIs. And, and I don't necessarily mean like public to the open internet. I just mean publicly uh, advertised and defined APIs. Your API, the, the microservice themselves should have an API that is well documented, uh, that is made available to other consumers inside the ecosystem. Uh, a couple things that need to be addressed with that public API at the beginning before, uh, before you, you release into production is, uh, first of all, versioning. How are you going to make changes to these APIs? Uh, it's kind of hard to implement a new versioning scheme after you've already deployed the first version of the API. Uh, lots of different approaches there. Some folks prefer using version numbers on URLs. Uh, others prefer using uh, version negotiation through uh, media type headers, content type headers. Uh, however you, you do it though, make sure there is an approach to versioning from the beginning. Uh, the other important thing with public APIs is make sure that uh, security is addressed at the very beginning. Uh, an anti-pattern that I've seen is organizations say, oh, well, hey, all these microservices are running inside our private network. We don't need to worry about authentication. Let all the microservices talk to each other. Do not do that. Solve authentication and authorization from the beginning. Ensure there's a way to validate the identity of calling applications. And uh, don't, don't, don't build that solution yourself. Like don't create your own crypto. Don't create your own authentication libraries. There's really good solutions out there already for this. I will actually talk a little bit today about how Istio can help in, in this place in a service mesh. But whatever you do, just, just use one of the, the frameworks that's already available to you. And then last is this idea of private implementations. So the public APIs are the only way that the data should be accessed that the microservice owns. So don't allow your microservices to do an end around and go directly to the database that sits behind those microservices. All traffic should go through the front door through the public API. Any, uh, any questions or comments from the group on this? Any challenges to any of this or any clarification we can go into? Um, it's Leo here. No, uh, let's say uh, something that I need to answer right now, but uh, when you talked about the, the public APIs and uh, well documented it is, how we uh, do you uh, touch base today around how we can make this uh, discoverable, how people can see it besides having like documented in, in uh, some uh, uh, form of uh, documentation out, out there or something like this, or what, what's our approach on it? So the most common approach that, that I've seen organizations do is just use Swagger. So the APIs are defined with, are you familiar with Swagger, Leo? Yeah, yeah. But again, that is, um, yeah, it's, um, I understand that that's the, the, the way that we do for, for, uh, for internal things. But I mostly think, do you, or have you seen uh, enterprises with a, a marketplace or something that uh, uh. people can understand and say, you know what? I, I, because one of the big things on, on and, I, and I heard of many different uh, large or huge organizations here on, the, on, the, uh, on this lab today, it's like a, how you prevent duplication, how you prevent start people reinventing their wheels when things are there. I mean, when you have already a kind of a service out there that you want to use or you could leverage to use, uh, I mean, if you don't know it, how will you make it aware of it? Yep. So uh, the equivalent of a, of a service catalog that folks can look at to determine what's available. Is that what you're getting at? Yeah, something like this. Um, I, I wanna open it up to the group real quick. Anybody else have any uh, uh, opinions on that for Leo on ways in which uh, organizations can make visible, how, how are you doing this right now? Anybody in your organization, how are you 
cataloging existing APIs. Looks like uh, lots of folks have the same challenge that you do, Leo. I mean, um, I'm not part of the feature team here in Capital One, right? But, uh, you know, I, I can explain in, in summary what, what I understand that we do here. Uh, if there is any other person in Capital One that can provide more, uh, uh, more uh, uh, information around that, but I think that uh, we, I think that we have a, we have a centralized place uh, that we call it debit exchange, I think, where we basically, you know, manage all the different APIs that uh, people are consuming across the whole organization. Uh, I don't know if that's that's the way that you uh, that's that's what you were asking uh, regarding, you know, that the, the publish and control of your APIs. But here we have a centralized platform that you know uh, controls most of the API that are consumed by different multiple applications, for microservices. Uh, and, and if you basically need to leverage one of those APIs or one of those microservices, you have to request, you know, uh, access to it and you have to provide information around what, what kind of use you're going to have with that uh, microservice and what are you going to be, your, uh, if I recall well, your TPS or your consumption rate, right? Uh, so they can plan in advance if they can support you and provide the specific uh, 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 TPS that you require on that particular microservice. I mean, I don't know if that, that helped. Yeah, sure. Um, as uh, Casey said, it's kind of a, uh, a catalog, right? When you have the services available. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, 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 I think it has several functions, right? It's a catalog, but also is is a centralized uh, way to control what is available so we don't have to rebuild it, right? And I mean, we don't want things to basically create the same thing that is already available. So we can, we can leverage it and also give you uh, a way to control how you use it and uh, control how much of that particular uh, microservice is going to be uh, provided to you, right, as, as a new application or a new platform. So we have several functions in addition to just a catalog of microservices available. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. Cool. Uh, any other feedback or uh, opinions, experience, anybody want to share on this before we start to jump into uh, actually our first lab? Uh, I know that a lot of the tools that we at Leatrio use publish their own uh, open API schemas similar to how you would use Swagger and just make those available on GitHub repos. Um, that's obviously for people who are consuming these APIs, um, you know, publicly and by publicly, I mean outside of whatever organization you happen to be in. Um, and I know that a lot of those tools happen to have success with that. If that's something that you can kind of bake into a CI process and you know, there's, there's certain types of these uh, packages that you can use that you can annotate certain methods or functions inside of your code to automatically update documentation afterwards. I've seen a lot of success with that. Yeah, good call. All right. Uh, so we are going to actually do our very first lab. I told you there was five labs. I lied. There's actually six uh, off by one errors always seem to uh, haunt me. This is our lab zero. Uh, so with this lab, we're going to just set up your workspace, your workspace that you're going to use for the rest of the day. So uh, let me introduce the core pieces of your workspace. The core things you're going to use are these two tools. You're going to use Slack and you're going to use AWS Cloud9. Uh, anybody ever use Cloud9 before? Anybody want to raise their hand and, and uh, Parker, you don't count. Alice, you got to come on. Uh, okay, what is Cloud9? Um, Cloud9 is a, uh, it's an, it's a web-based IDE that AWS offers. It used to be its own company, AWS acquired it. Uh, they've done a nice job of pulling it into the AWS environment. But what happens is when you create a Cloud9 workspace, you actually just get an EC2 instance behind the scenes. So everybody here is gonna get their own Cloud9 workspace, which means you're all gonna get your own EC2 instance in our account, or you're not gonna be paying for any of this. Uh, 
you'll get an EC2 instance in our account. And what's cool is this is what the uh, environment ends up looking like. On the left, you have a navigator to view all of your files. You have a command line access to the Ubuntu EC2 instance directly. So you can run uh, commands directly from there. Uh, we're going to have a series of commands you're going to need to run. And then you've got an editor. Now, the reason we uh, went this, path, this way is, is, well, we don't want to trust that everybody's workspace is going to be able to run all the tools we need. So this is a way to, to get everybody going quickly. Leo, did you have a question? No, no. Okay, sorry. Uh, so Cloud9, great environment. You'll be able to get in there and do work. One of the other nice things about Cloud9 is uh, you can actually, it's great for pair programming. You can share your workspace with other folks. In Google Docs, where you're in there, multiple people are editing the document at the same time. You have the very same experience with Cloud9. So multiple people can be in there making changes uh, at once and you can uh, have a conversation and collaborate about software uh, in, in a nice way, especially in these remote times. Um, cool, so we're gonna, right now, uh, this first lab, you're gonna set up your, your uh, very own Cloud9 workspace and just to make sure you're ready for the rest of the other labs. Um, you're gonna use uh, something called an SDM. SDM is a software delivery machine. Uh, software delivery machine is, is a generic term that describes this approach to using automation to automate common tasks that developers need. So rather than having to jump around to all these different tools, you know, developers need to jump to their source code tool, their CI tool, to the, to the different environments where they run their workloads. The, the SDM provides a single interface for a developer to get everything done that they need to get done. So we've, we've created our own uh, SDM. We call them Sparky. Uh, Sparky is a bot inside of the Slack workspace that you're already in. So you're, you're going to use Sparky to get your workspace set up. So uh, what you're going to, so here's an example of some stuff that Sparky can do for you. So for example, if a build is running, Sparky lets you know, hey, Jenkins is currently running this build, this commit ID, and you can see the progress as Sparky builds, deploys, and uh, promotes your application. So uh, with that, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to y'all to get going with your very first lab. In this lab, the goal is to get your own Cloud9 workspace set up. So you should all be tracking along uh, with me. If you're not, uh, then jump either in the support channel and just say, hey, uh, I lost track, where am I supposed to be? Uh, maybe can someone, someone from Liatro do me a favor and just drop a link uh, actually, I can just do it. I'm right here. Uh, I'm going to just drop this link into the general channel, uh, labs, lab zero. Uh, just drop this link. So that's where you're going to start from. Go ahead and click that link uh, in the general channel and start walking through this at your own pace. The goal is that by the end, you've got your own Cloud9 workspace set up, ready to go with all the tools that you need. We're going to actually be running Kubernetes locally on your Cloud9 instance. Uh, so this this will set up a microcades cluster locally on your Cloud9 workspace. All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started with uh, the last little bit of lecture before we then get into our first real lab. Uh, last chance, anybody have a question before I get going? All right, let's go. Uh, so in order to get into the first lab, the first lab is really all about containers, how we're going to containerize our application. We've got this legacy app. We want to get it running in a Docker container inside Kubernetes. We need to talk about a few tools that you're going to be using. Uh, we're going to talk about Kubernetes. We're going to talk about a tool called Helm, which is a tool that helps to package your Kubernetes applications and run them uh, in the cluster. And then we're going to use another tool called scaffold to help with the developer experience. Um, so let's start with Kubernetes. Uh, sounds like a fair bit of you are currently using Kubernetes in some capacity. Uh, so might be a little bit of a, uh, a review, but I think it's good for all of us to get on the same page here. I'm just going to cover a few core Kubernetes resources that we're going to need to know for the rest of the labs today. Uh, so the first thing I want to talk about Let's talk about a cluster, first of all. So a cluster is really a collection of Kubernetes nodes. It's a logical thing that spans different nodes. Uh, a node being uh, something that it's, a, it's either a virtual machine or a physical machine. It's 
in, in this case, we're using EC2 instances. So each node is represented by an EC2 instance in our cluster. The collection of nodes together represents our cluster. Uh, there's a couple uh, there's a couple special types of nodes, which are these uh, master nodes, which are currently running etcd, and they manage all of the scheduling of our pods and containers in the various nodes. Uh, we're using Amazon's EKS server today, service today, which means that we're not running the master nodes ourselves. Uh, the master nodes are managed by AWS and the EKS service. We only have to uh, bring our own worker nodes to the cluster, register them with EKS, and then EKS schedules uh, the workloads on those nodes. Uh, a node consists of a, uh, a VM running Kubelet. Kubelet is a, a process that re registers with the cluster and manages the scheduling of pods. And uh, let's, let's go ahead and talk about pods a little bit. Um, Actually, before we do, I want to I want to look at a, a comic. Uh, this is uh, from Julia Evans. If you don't know the name, you should go check her out. Follow her on Twitter. She writes these great uh, comics that help describe challenging technical things in a way that makes sense. At least it really helps me. Uh, and so this is a great example. We're going to spend a little bit of time here because if you understand this, then you'll really understand not just the basics of Kubernetes, but how all tools in the Kubernetes ecosystem tend to be architected and designed. So it's really worth getting this picture. Okay. So this is a, a real brief four cell comic on how pods get scheduled in Kubernetes. So you see that you run the command kubectl apply. That means apply some YAML into a cluster. kubectl apply dash F my pod definition dot YAML. So you got a YAML file that contains your pod. You want to run a pod. So you run kubectl. What happens? So kubectl is a command line tool running on your local machine. You're saying to the API server, hey, uh, here's a pod defined in YAML. And etcd, the AP, or I'm sorry, the API server just stores the YAML in etcd and says, okay, it's done. So API server does not start your pod. The API server does not start your pod. All the API server does is store the YAML into etcd, okay? Next cell. What happens now is the scheduler, which is a special process running on the control plane, on the master nodes, the scheduler is monitoring etcd. And the schedule says, uh-oh, there's a pod that's in etcd that doesn't have a machine assigned to it. So the scheduler detects that there's this pod that nobody's assigned to a node. So the scheduler in cell three then updates the YAML in etcd through the API server and says, assign the pod to this machine X. So the scheduler looks across all the nodes, figures out which one makes sense to schedule it on and updates the YAML in etcd. Again, what does uh, etcd say? Okay, it doesn't do anything. It just stores the YAML. It's just, think about it as just a, a basic CRUD operation. And then the last thing that happens is now kubelet which is the process running on one of the nodes, it's also monitoring etcd, and it notices that there is a pod that's supposed to be running on its node. It's assigned to itself, but Kubelet has not started it yet. So Kubelet says, okay, I'm gonna go and launch it. It launches the container, and then it reaches back into API server, says, I'm running it now. Etcd says, okay. So this is, this is the, 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 the way that all of the Kubernetes uh, tools in the ecosystem work in that there's this idea of very loose coupling where when a change needs to be made, it's not imperative. It's not one system reaching in and pushing another system. It's more declarative. You declare the desired state of something and then somebody else notices that the declared, the, 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 the um, desired state doesn't match the current state. And so it does a converge of some sort. That's that it's really important to understand that piece because it's going to play out over and over today. Cool. Any questions on this? So, so if it is, is it a similar thing or completely different from a Docker um, compose or sort of that uh, where 
I kind of declare all my containers, all its resources, and I declare it in a YAML, and it Docker takes care of, you know, the Docker uh, cluster or whatever. Yep. So, yeah. so it, it, it's similar in the sense that you are declaring things in a YAML file. The, the way that this works with, with Kubernetes, though, is it allows extension very easily. One of the things we'll see is that uh, we'll look at other things like how canaries are created and how ingresses are created. All of them follow this same model of you declare something in etcd and somebody, some other process can monitor for that and then do work based on it. All right, so let's keep going through here. So what is a pod? Uh, a pod is the closest analogy uh, to a VM that I can come up with. Uh, you're, you're, a, a container is not analogous to a virtual machine, but a pod is kind of close to it in that a pod has an IP address. A pod can have a collection of processes running. In this case, those processes are run through containers. So one pod can have many containers. A pod can have uh, volumes attached to it. Those can be uh, transient volumes that disappear when the pod disappears, or those can be durable, persistent volumes that live on beyond the life of that one pod. Uh, and so you declare a pod through YAML. In this case, this is a, an example of what some basic YAML looks like. For a pod, you give it a kind of pod. Uh, you can give it some metadata, what you want your labels to be and your name. We'll see why labels are important in just a minute. And then you give it a list of containers that you want to run. Again, you can run multiple containers in a pod. So in this case, we're running just one container. We're running the Nginx containers, what we're gonna call it. The Docker image is Nginx colon 1.3.6. Uh, the next thing that I wanna share is this idea of a service. So services replace the idea of like a load balancer in a, a, a legacy like VM type deployment. With services, you declare them through Kubernetes, through YAML again. Uh, in this case, we're using the kind service instead of kind pod. Uh, and then you, you have to provide a little bit of information that describes your service. So the, the, the easy one is we describe what port. So in this case, we're listening on port 9376. That's the, the port that the service is um, uh, managing. And then what, what's really interesting here is the way the service knows where to, to uh, route the traffic, which pods to route the traffic to, is through a, a label selector, right? And so let's talk about how that looks. So um, up here, we've got two services. We've got service A, which is using the label selector app equals A. And then we've got service B, which uses the label selector app equals B. So then two services are created, uh, two load balancers, if you will. And then we've got these three nodes here and pod A is running over here. It's got a label on it of app equals A. Therefore, the service will only send traffic to this one pod. You got these other two pods with labels app equals B. I'm sorry, three pods. App equals B, app equals B, app equals B. In this case, the service is able to round robin the traffic across those three pods because they all have the appropriate label that uh, matches up with the label selector. So no longer are you needing to add and remove stuff from a load balancer by IP address uh, statically. You can just use labels and they can uh, find the appropriate pod to route traffic. Um, one last thing to point out with on services is that the way in which uh, services work is very different from a traditional load balancer and that the service itself is not in the flow of traffic. Okay, what do I mean by that? So when you create a service, what you've done is you've, just like we talked about in that comic from Julia Evans with pods, with services, you're just creating some YAML, dumping it in etcd. That API server then has that service. There's now another process. We talked about kubelet that runs on each node. There's another process that runs on each node called kubeproxy. Kubeproxy is monitoring for services that are defined in the um, etcd service. And anytime it finds one, it creates IP tables records on that node to route traffic for that virtual IP address that the service has with these um, backend pods. So 
What that means is when you have a client that wants to talk to the service, the client doesn't talk to Qproxy directly. The client doesn't talk to some load balancer. The client uses IP tables rules defined uh, at, on the node itself to figure out how to route the traffic to the appropriate pod. So it's a real interesting distinction between services and the load balancer analogy that I made. That's where the analogy breaks down is that there's not some proxy in the middle. It's actually just a low level IP tables networking. Uh, and then the last thing that I want to talk about are deployments. So with deploy, you need a way to manage your pods being deployed into an environment. Deployments make it easy to manage those replications of pods. So a deployment resource, let's look at the YAML first and then we'll go back and look at that picture. When you create a deployment, uh, you give it uh, some specifications, specifically how many replicas do I want? So if I wanted three of these pods running, I would use three for the replicas. You give it a selector. The selector tells uh, the deployment how to know which pods it's managing. So in this case, it's looking for pods with these two labels, app of Spring Trader version of one. When those labels match, the deployment then knows that's a pod that it's going to be managing. Uh, and then you've got a spec here that says, hey, we want to run uh, Nginx 1.7.9. We're going to run it three times uh, and it's exposing um, uh, service on port 80. And then what this looks like is, um, let me give this a chance to refresh here. So we've got, uh, wait for it, here we go. We've got uh, a service and a deployment with four pods running. Let's say I update the pod to use a new version of the image. The deployment will provision a new pod and then another new pod and start replacing the old pods with the new ones and then eventually completely update the pod. So it's doing a rolling deployment for you. That's one nice thing, deployments manage, rolling deployments of pod updates in your cluster. Okay, so that covers the basics of Kubernetes. That's, that's really the core uh, resources we're gonna need for today. We need to talk about a tool called Helm. Helm is a open source uh, tool for managing deployments in your cluster. Uh, Helm provides three core uh, 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 primitives that are used in defining these deployments. First, there's this idea of a chart. A chart is a collection of all the different deployments you need to make. So whereas typically you might need to create a deployment and a, um, uh, a service and maybe some RBAC rules and a service account, all of those resources would be their own YAML files. Rather than applying them individually, you can lash them all together into a chart. So that, that's, it's a way to do um, bundling of resources for Kubernetes. You create this Helm chart. The other nice thing with the Helm chart is that you can use templates. So whereas our resource would look like this historically with the version number for Nginx hard coded, we can instead replace that with some templating syntax. And then that allows you to at Helm deploy time to uh, pass in the appropriate values that you want to use uh, rather than having them hard coded in the image. It also allows you to reuse that chart. So multiple people could use the same chart, but, but choose different versions of that image at, at deploy time. Uh, and then I the last, sorry, go ahead, one. I have a question here. So uh, can you, can you, I mean, if you have a few more, uh, a few more minutes, can you elaborate uh, maybe when you finish, what is the main difference between this uh, and because you can achieve the same thing just using kubectl apply, right? Um, because you're, you're applying YAML files. But uh, my question is because w we were doing some up, up great inversions on, on Kubernetes recently. And let me tell you, man, we struggled big time with this Helm stuff because based on the different versions of Kubernetes, the latest one, Helm has some trouble working with the syntax and all that stuff. So uh, a few things that we were doing using Helm, uh, one or two, we basically have to migrate and, and deploy using kubectl. But my, my question is more around, you know, can that be done apart from the specific features that Helm provide, like, a, you know, charts that can put a lot of uh, things together and using variables? Or is yeah. there is anything else that, you know, basically you, you take advantage using Helm? 
So uh, it's a it's a fair question. There are some sharp edges with Helm. Uh, I would I, I would ask just out of curiosity, are you using Helm two or Helm three specifically? Do you still have Tiller or not? Yeah, Tiller was there in the in the in the previous version. Uh, with but with version three, Tiller basically looks to like disappear. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So it sounds like part of the challenge may have been your upgrade from Helm two to three. So there was, there was, this picture needs to be upgraded. We're not using Helm two anymore in, in our labs. Um, in the previous versions of Helm, there was a component that ran in your cluster called Tiller that managed the actual deployments. Helm three has since replaced that. And there's a handful of uh, approaches to migrating from Helm two to Helm three. Uh, it can be a little bit bumpy along the way, but back to your question, uh, there, there are things that can be done with, uh, without using Helm. So you can apply multiple resources all at once through uh, kubectl apply. You can have a YAML file that has multiple resources. So you are yeah. able to bundle things. That's, that's doable. Yeah. Um, <coughs> you can also do some level of uh, templating through customize. Customize comes baked into kubectl. So you could uh, do some of this uh, very pulling out of variables. But the, the couple, couple things that you can't do very well without Helm is the idea of um, pulling together multiple resources and representing them as a single uh, atomic operation. So for example, if I want to delete a resource uh, or if I want to delete a whole bunch of resources, I know that there is a thing called a release in my cluster represented by a, a resource in the cluster that I can use the Helm command line, call delete, and it'll clean up all the things associated with that. Okay. Uh, that gets a little trickier. And, and another piece that gets kind of tricky too is let's say I've got this, this group of things, let's say there's six resources in a single YAML file, and I remove one of them. If I do a kubectl apply, it's not going to detect that I removed something and remove it's, it. It's gonna deploy everything again, right? Well, it would, it, would, it would just patch things that changed. Yeah. Yeah. So whereas Helm says, oh, okay, there used to be six things. Now there's five. I will go ahead and delete that extra thing for you. And so it has that uh, a better awareness of managing all the, the resources there. And then the last thing I want to share with Helm is most projects that you'd want to run inside your cluster, uh, open source projects, or even now commercial projects, offer a means by which to install the software through a Helm chart. So it becomes one of those things that it's, it's a common currency that you can use as an easy way to consume other uh, uh, services that folks offer. So um, I, I'm gonna agree with you that Helm has some things that suck, but uh, it also uh, provides some things that provide some value. So okay. um, thank you, I, thank you for that explanation. Yeah, you bet. Um, I got to keep rolling, but I, I, if we've got some time, happy to um, discuss that a little bit more. Folks want to go there. Um, okay, the last thing, the last tool that we need to talk about before we can get into the lab is this idea of using Scaffold. So Scaffold is another command line tool. It was created by Google, and it provides a means by which to orchestrate the other tools that you're using, both locally and in your development environment. So what tools am I talking about? Well, uh, let, you need a way to build your Docker images and you need a way to deploy your Helm charts. Scaffold can orchestrate all of that for you. So with Scaffold, I can run a single command to, to do a build. It will do, uh, it'll run the Docker build on all of my different Docker files. It will tag them using a strategy that you can define in the, in the Scaffold config file. And then it can push the images for you to a Docker registry. Scaffold can then use those images that it just pushed to then pass in as variables to a Helm chart and deploy, either install or upgrade, whatever's appropriate, the, uh, the release into your cluster. So it provides a mechanism to do both local development and CICD using the same tools in a consistent environment. Um, so scaffold build, uh, here's a sample scaffold file that you, you'll be committing to your repository. Scaffold uh, just defines a list of artifacts it needs to build. When you run the command scaffold build, it uh, builds the images, tags them, and pushes them. And then if we do a scaffold deploy, uh, we've got, in this case, our deploy is using Helm. Uh, so we specify the path to our Helm chart. And then you can see there's lots of different uh, uh, paths that you can configure scaffold to use. So in, 
like for a build, you can use just straight Docker builds. You can use um, uh, Basil, which is Google's build system. I've never used it. Uh, looks pretty dense to me. Uh, Jib, which is a way to build images directly in Maven or Gradle. Uh, there's a couple other options like Canico and um, Google Cloud Build that you can use for, for doing builds. But for today, we're just gonna use this box highlight in red. We're just gonna use Docker files. Uh, you could test your artifacts with scaffold and then you configure a tagging strategy. We're just using git commit IDs for our strategy. Uh, scaffold then pushes. And then finally, you can use uh, various options for deployment, either cuddle directly, Helm or customize. We'll be using Helm today. Uh, okay, uh, I'm gonna walk through this environment pretty quick here and then turn it over to Parker to get us going on our first lab. So the environment that you're using today consists of uh, five different core modules. Um, the, this is all running in our own AWS account. We stood up this account just for today, uh, but just wanna give you guys a little bit of uh, overview of what's going on in this account. There's an infrastructure layer, which consists of the uh, deployment of the AWS account, a, a EKS cluster, and a set of EC2 instances that are uh, serving as our worker nodes. We use a set of tools to help with managing the cluster. For example, we use uh, an open source tool called external DNS that monitors for DNS needs inside the cluster and it automatically then reaches in Route 53 and creates uh, record sets for us. We use a tool called Cert Manager, open source tool from Jetstack that uh, will notice the need for TLS certificates and reach out to Let's Encrypt and create uh, publicly trusted uh, certificates. Uh, and then we use a tool called Cluster Autoscaler that monitors for needs of uh, CPU or memory pressure in the cluster that avoid uh, scheduling and we'll reach out to AWS Autoscaler and actually scale the cluster out or in based on uh, the appropriate load inside the cluster. So that's the infrastructure layer. Uh, we then have the tool chain layer which consists of the various tools that we use to uh, run the cluster, to ru that, that run, these tools all run in the cluster and they help with the building of continuous delivery pipelines and running of your application. So we use Harbor for our Docker registry. Harbor runs inside the cluster and you'll be pushing your images to there from your pipeline. Uh, we use Istio for doing, uh, uh, managing the service mesh of the uh, application. We'll, we'll cover that in a bit. Uh, we use Nginx uh, for our ingress controllers, and we use a tool called Keycloak for doing uh, identity management inside the cluster. The, the SDM we talked about a little bit. Y'all met Sparky already. So the SDM is running in the cluster itself. So Sparky is just a bot. It's a deployment that runs inside the cluster. Uh, there's a dashboard that's configured inside the cluster. Uh, you'll see things like this. We'll, we'll get to look at this a little bit later. So currently we're running 33 nodes in a cluster. It's overkill, but we want to make sure you all have a good experience today. So we beefed the cluster up. We're currently only using uh, less than one vCPU out of uh, 123 allocatable vCPU. So we'll, we'll see this number go up as you guys start getting through the labs, but that's all visible through our dashboard that is built around Grafana, Elasticsearch, uh, Prometheus, and then we use Fluent D for log collection, actually Fluent Bit. Uh, not fluent D, for log collection and uh, aggregation in Elasticsearch. Uh, finally, we've got this concept of products. Each of you will be managing your own product today. Your product is represented by, by the Slack channel that you created. So think about that Slack channel is where your team would be doing work. They get in there and they're gonna collaborate around some software. Today, you're gonna to go ahead and create your own pipelines, create your own uh, deployments of your applications, uh, as though you are a part of a product team. You'll be a product team of one. Uh, maybe we'll join you so you don't feel so lonely, but that team will be managing the build of your applications. And so anything that your team needs to build would be a part of that product. So there's one environment, there's one infrastructure layer, one tool chain layer, one SDM layer, one dashboard layer, but there are many products. Each of you will have your own product running on this one shared uh, environment. All right, I know that was a lot. Let me pause real quick for questions before I turn it over to Parker. Any questions or any, any clarification needed on the environment that we're gonna be using today? 